During the 1960s in South Korea, the Inhua School for the Disabled was established. And today, we'll be peeling back the layers on the despicable and horrific events that occurred behind the doors of this facility. As a result of the duration of the incident as well as the cruelty involved, this has become one of the most notorious scandals in Korean history. As we discuss these dark and corrupt events, we will gradually reach a conclusion that will shock many viewers and leave them with nothing but frustration. We will be covering sensitive material that includes several forms of assault, and if that alone was not bad enough, the assault was at the expense of disabled children. So do be warned, if you don't think you will be comfortable listening to that kind of information, feel free to click off of the video at any point. Now without further ado, let's begin. Gwangju is a city in the southwestern region of South Korea and residing within it is the Inhua School for the Disabled. And in modern times, Gwangju may look like any other inconspicuous city that you'd visit. However, some may not know of the disturbing past within the city. The Inhua School mainly focused on teaching students that were deaf and or mute, but also accepted students with other disabilities. Along with the actual teaching facility itself, there was a dormitory next door which housed many of the students. In fact, many of those students were orphans. And those that were fortunate enough to have a family to return to were oftentimes part of lower income households. Some of them lived with their grandparents, and some even had a parent that had a disability themselves. Which made these students easier targets for the corrupt to take advantage of. And being that the school focused its attention on those with intellectual disabilities, the government granted the facility with extra funding. Furthermore, the Inhua school received many public donations in the form of checks, as well as supplies for the students to use in classrooms. But instead of actually using these donations for their intended purpose, some of the staff members pocketed the money for themselves and sold off any items that they couldn't use. And during an investigation that took place in 2005, it was found out that multiple staff members, including the principal, actually assaulted and raped over nine students. These actions were said to have started in the year 2000, but it's very likely that members of the staff have been assaulting their students for much longer. But if we just go off of what is official, these abusive events went on for five years. And if you're wondering to yourself just how this went on for so long, from what I understand, teaching positions are highly sought after and prestigious overseas, not to mention that they are very difficult to obtain in the first place. So anyone who was already teaching at the school at the time likely had to sacrifice a lot to get there. Some teachers even had to pay their school money out of their own pocket to get their positions. So out of fear of losing their job and wasting all of their effort to get where they were, many teachers and staff just shut up and sat on the sidelines. And if at any point a teacher did attempt to tell people that the school was assaulting its students, the head staff or the principal would bribe them to keep them silent. If this method didn't work, the staff would resort to violence. Members of the staff themselves or other people that were hired would beat them to the point where they would just give up entirely. For example, an ex-teacher claimed that he was beaten and forced to resign after he threatened to tell authorities that he found two students beaten and starved to death. These two students were said to have been buried somewhere on the school campus. And supposedly, there were even a number of authorities who were aware of what was going on at the Inhua school, but they received money in exchange for their silence. Even the students themselves reached out for help, whether that be from other teachers within the school or their own parents. But as you can probably guess, their cries for help basically went unheard. When the principal or any head staff member learned that a student was trying to expose them, they would call them over and push themselves onto them or punish them in another manner. This was typically enough to discourage any students from seeking help in the future. It was only after a brand new teacher named Jung Yung Sup informed human rights groups that these events came to light. Jean was appointed as a teacher at Inhua in the summer of 2005. At first, he was slightly taken aback at how the students acted in front of him. Most of them seemed rather reserved and kind of scared almost whenever Jean approached or called upon them. But these are children at the end of the day, so he thought they were just being shy and needed some more time before they were comfortable with him. Little did he know, it was another reason entirely that these kids were closing themselves off from him. 
One day, a parent of one of the students contacted John, telling him that their student was being touched inappropriately, and any sane adult would obviously be shocked and frustrated upon hearing this. So John reached out to the students who was being subjected to this, and they did confirm that yes, they were being molested. And another thing about this school was that many of their teachers didn't even know sign language, or they only knew the bare bones of it. Which I guess now isn't even that surprising knowing how terrible the school was in the first place. However, Jean on the other hand actually has a disability himself and was much more knowledgeable in sign language. So he not only resonated with the students but was also able to understand them to a higher degree. When Jean visited the earlier mentioned student, they not only confirmed his initial fear, but he also found out that that child was being regularly beaten by the staff. Along the student's arms and legs, there were bruises. The student also said that all of their previous attempts to get help from teachers basically resulted in them shooing the student away. And as I stated earlier, if teachers found out that a student tried to get help, they would punish them, which quickly derailed any future attempts to expose the school. Overcome with rage, Jean asked a few of the other staff members about this abuse and they all more or less just brushed him off with something like, yeah, it's been going on for years now, so what? Some of the other teachers assured him that they would get to the bottom of the situation and sort things out. But after several days without any word, Jean realized that everyone but himself was either in on the disgusting acts or just didn't care enough to put their career on the line. Not entirely sure what the next step should be, Jean consulted another school and told their head staff about what was going on. They, like Jean, were appalled at what they were hearing, but fortunately they did take him seriously. The staff from this other school got into contact with authorities that they trusted and they pulled aside some of the students that reported their abuse and interviewed them. One of the girls said that at first a male principal touched her inappropriately, but when this happened, she didn't think much of it. Of course, she was uncomfortable, but since she wasn't hurt, she just let it slide. Afterwards, that same principal would call her into an office where she was shown adult films while the teacher was baiting. Several other student witnesses claimed that a teacher would put on some sort of educational movie for the class and then rearrange the desks to where the corner seat could not be visible. From there, the teacher turned off all of the lights and called over one of the female students into that corner so that he could push himself onto her. One of the male classmates that was in the room at the time decided to stand up for the girl and tell the teacher to stop and that what he was doing was disgusting. The teacher, obviously beyond reason, just told that student to shut up and if he or anyone in the room reported what he was doing, then he'd kill them. One student was even said to have been tied up and gagged and then tossed into the back of one of the private offices reserved for the head staff. And while that child was trapped in there, they were for nearly an entire day. On other occasions when a student was either misbehaving or even if they did poorly on an exam, the teachers would punish them in ways that are beyond uncalled for. As you could probably guess, these punishments involved adult acts, but some students were even subject to water torture or being struck with broken glass bottles. And then, if all of this wasn't enough already, some of the teaching staff even followed the students home. On the way, they would berate them and demand that they perform these adult acts. So now, these students are not only in danger at school, but possibly at home as well. A head admin even brought a student back home with him to his wife and children, and he used all of this fake praise like, oh, she's such a hardworking student, she's top of her class, and just a joy to teach. The student knew that if she decided to speak up, she'd just be beaten at school, so she decided to go along with it and mustered out a fake smile. Whenever the wife and the rest of the family decided to leave the house, the principal would trap the girl in a room and begin beating and raping the student. And if you recall, towards the beginning of the video, I mentioned that there was a dormitory as well. Oftentimes, the head staff of the school made their way over to the dorm at night to assault the boys and girls that resided within. Additionally, something else that makes this entire situation all the more dreadful is knowing that some of the staff didn't even bother hiding this from the children, so all the students could do while their peers were being attacked was to listen to their cries and wait in fear and just hope that they were not going to become a target as well.
After learning that Jean exposed the school by contacting authorities, the principal immediately fired him in an attempt to sort of say that he was some sort of incompetent teacher that was just spouting nonsense. But as we know, by now it was too late. There were too many members of the public that were now aware of the disgusting acts that Inhua was conducting on their students. With the rising support of the public, nine victims came forward and exposed the staff members. However, it's more or less certain that there were many more students that were also assaulted but chose to remain silent in fear of any repercussions. We have to remember that many of these kids came from poor households and were sort of in a way conditioned to fear the school no matter where they were. And those earlier mentioned orphans that only had the dorm to live in would 100% get kicked out of their only home if they decided to testify. Or even worse, they could be killed because we already know that the staffing here is not afraid to do that. Furthermore, some just felt immense embarrassment over all that they suffered through and didn't want their identities to be revealed to the rest of the world. Several of these victims were invited onto national television to share their stories, and about four to five months after this, more authorities finally began their investigation into the school. Once this issue gained national attention, parents, students, and numerous Guangzhou citizens visited the school every single day and decided to sit in the back of the classrooms to make sure that the staff members didn't continue to take advantage of the students. While these people were sitting inside the classrooms, there were also public protests outside of the school demanding justice. So what exactly happened to the scum that were responsible for all of this? Well, before we take a look at that, I think now is a good time to tell you that all of the head staff that ran everything behind the school were actually all related, which was a major contributing factor as to why these horrendous acts were able to go on for as long as they did. Authorities determined there to be six total people that were involved and only four of them received prison terms. The principal of the school got about two and a half years in prison, but I do want to say that this may be incorrect because a couple of sources that I found said that he was actually sentenced to five years. Being that this is a foreign affair, there are definitely some details that could be skewed in translation. But this won't matter at all in the end, and I'll explain why in just a little bit. You may be thinking to yourself that even five years seems pretty light considering all that was being done at the school, but it gets much worse. The head of administration, who from what I heard was one of, if not the worst of all of the culprits, received eight f***ing months in prison. And there were also other individuals, such as the principal's wife, that didn't even receive any sort of punishment at all. The principal's wife, as well as some other female staff, was responsible for covering things up so that the public didn't hear of any of what was going on inside the school. And then this is where things become truly infuriating. So remember just now I mentioned that it really doesn't matter how long the principal's sentence was? Well, that's because in the appeal trial held afterwards, the court said that the punishment was actually too severe for what was done. So instead of the already short prison sentence, the principal just got probation and a 3 million won fine, which in USD I believe that's around like $2,500. And amongst those other people that received prison terms, they all basically served less than a year since the statute of limitations for their crimes had expired. They even got their positions back in the Inhua school after getting out. I guess no matter how we think that these people should be punished, we do have to remember that this is in another country entirely and their legal system is much different. Not to mention, this trial was held back in the 2000s. I won't be trying to confuse anyone with technical legal jargon, but apparently SA back then in South Korea was not considered to be a federal crime. What that means is that in order for a real investigation to happen, the victims themselves had to sue the culprits, and remember most of the families who sent their kids to Inhua were very poor, some even being orphans. So those victims that didn't have the means to escalate the situation were more or less just stuck, as the government didn't really see this as their problem. Additionally, the courts allowed for the victims and the culprits to mediate their cases, meaning that they could reach some sort of agreement and then all criminal charges would be dropped. And on the surface, this may not seem like that big of a deal, but remember, it's very easy to take advantage of the victims here. Someone such as the principal could just visit their victims and then offer them a small sum of money that wasn't much to them, but was a significant amount to the families. Furthermore, I want to talk about the earlier mentioned statute of limitations. Back in 2005, that statute of limitations for minors over the age of 13 was one year after coming into contact with the suspect. 
So after a year of that incident happening, those poor victims couldn't even do anything even if they were in a position to do so. So while in the moment this entire situation may just seem like all doom and gloom, about half a decade into the future, we get a bit of justice you could say. If you have prior knowledge of this incident, you may have noticed that I have yet to mention the film titled Silenced, which came out in 2011. In case you guys are not aware, this film was inspired by the 2009 novel titled The Crucible, which was based on the real life events of the Inhua school that we just discussed. And personally, I have not watched the entire movie, I've only seen clips, but from what I heard, this film actually toned down on all the sexual and physical violence that happened, yet it was still regarded by many to be extremely dark. The silenced film gained international attention which reignited the interest regarding the incident. Protests and public outrage began to rise in 2011 due to this film. The public was now again demanding justice for the victims, but also to hopefully use the perpetrators as an example to deter any future offenders. This newfound attention led authorities to reopen the investigation and they were able to find significant new evidence. These new details were able to put that head of administration, who originally got 8 months in prison, behind bars for 8 years. Additionally, there was an update to the statute of limitations that stated that there would be no statute at all for cases that involved the disabled and minors under the age of 13. Nowadays, most of these victims are adults and they have no choice but to live with these terrible memories and experiences. Some of these victims even mention that they are incapable of being in romantic relationships because of their psychological damage. It truly is just a terrible thing knowing that these sort of extreme events happen all around the world and that those that have the least power are likely to suffer the most. So that's going to end the video. Thank you all so much for your time if you made it this far. Let me know how you feel about this incident as I just felt kind of defeated throughout the process of researching this case. When it came to the actual events within the schools and then the legal results, it just seemed like despair after despair. And I think what sucks the most is knowing that some of these victims were orphans that even died as a result of all of this. So again, thank you all very much for spending your time with me as we discuss the terrible in Hua School incident. I hope you guys do have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you all again very soon.